The members of the panel are Amar Bhattachari, Brookings Institution, Kurt Bock, BASF, Ludger Schuchnecht, German Ministry of Finance, Lord Nicholas Stern, London School of Economics. This panel is moderated by journalist Connie Chimoch. Yeah, we wish uh, the solution to the climate change could be as easy as the Harry Potter music uh, that we have uh, been hearing uh, as, a, as a land underlying uh, sound. Um, let me just uh, uh, very quickly address uh, the members of the panels that haven't spoken yet. Uh, so please forgive me, Nick. Um, Kurt Bock, um, you have sort of uh, two hats, of course, uh, CEO of BASF, uh, one of the major German corporate players. <laughs> Um, lots uh, engaged uh, in energy, whilst of course your core business is something else, but um, that links you very closely to uh, the climate change and finance debate. And you also had it a group um, by the B20, and we've just heard uh, Celine saying that you actually did come to an agreement. Now, how difficult was it to come to an agreement, and what would you say were the essence um, of that agreement that the B20 is putting forward in the G20 process. Yeah, let me start by saying that um, in business we have relatively little experience in coming together in these multilateral types of, of meetings as you, we do it here today. So for us it was kind of an experiment when we, we met uh, companies from very different countries and backgrounds talking about climate change and energy efficiency and our expectation was that that process to come to a conclusion would take quite some time. Actually, we moved on very, very quickly and, and could agree on a couple of major proposals, which I think make a lot of sense, which clearly tells you that business by and large has received the message that we have to act and we cannot wait for regulators and lawmakers to um, step up to, their, to the plate. And for that reason, actually, we feel in, in business that we as drivers of change and providers of innovation should come forward with proposals. Have to act. What are you acting on first? Uh, we want to have, first of all, we want to have a level playing field, which is all about carbon pricing. We know that with uh, Paris, the platform has been set and the goals have been uh, established. However, the devil is in the detail. Uh, and now it's up to the individual countries to really step forward and uh, provide tangible targets. Our concern, obviously, is that uh, we will have uh, hugely different uh, proposals country by country. And for that reason, we think that G20, which causes 80% of the CO2 emissions globally, the G20 should really step forward. And that core group of, of countries should really develop a platform to establish rules for carbon pricing to have a convergence over time of the different schemes. We see already the European example, we see what's happening in, an example in China, yet most countries still have to uh, come forward and I think this is a unique opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, I turn to Ludger Schuchnecht, um, who is the chief economist at the German Ministry of Finance, but who is also the vice chairper uh, to the uh, G20, and you've got the ear um, of your minister. Uh, now, um, we had a just a funny incident uh, as we were discussing uh, the market price for carbon, and of course this morning we had a session here saying that economists have actually come together, uh, amongst uh, others, uh, also Lord Stern, uh, saying, you know, this could be uh, the market price for carbon, and you say, should that actually be determined by the government? So why was that question mark there, and what would you have instead? And well what is the right carbon price? Well, I, I, I assume that um, I as regards the, the financing of climate change and uh, also sustainable infrastructure, we need a proper pricing mechanism. And um, typically, we would say that market-based pricing is, is, is the right way to price uh, scarce goods and uh, you know the environment is a scarce good as we've just heard from professor edenhofer you know we have a limited budget so uh, in that sense um, uh, we have a risk that if prices are set if technical modes are set that we get into inefficient ways of achieving these objectives 
what's the contribution of the government, i.e., what's the constru co uh, contribution of the Ministry of Finance? Um, I mean, of course, policy is framework setting. We've just heard Lord Stern that sort of we have to have the right policies. Um, what are the right policies from your point of view? I, I think that as a Ministry of Finance and also as um, the presidency of the finance track in G20, we have uh, um, quite a role here to play both nationally and internationally. Nationally, of course, uh, we play a key role in all financing related ma matters, financial market related matters. But I think perhaps for the audience, it's more interesting what we do in the, in the G20 context. Um, and I think um, what people perhaps sometimes don't keep in mind is how important a stable macroeconomic environment is as a kind of a basic prerequisite, prerequisite and as a basic institutional uh, element. I mean, you need sound public finances, you need a, you know, a healthy uh, financial system, uh, w reasonably low inflation. Without all this, you will not have a financing environment that will give you the necessary investment towards, uh, um, towards uh, a better environment. And it will not give the governments the scope, neither the financial scope nor the, priori the ability to prioritize climate-related issue. And government that's always in crisis mode is very distracted. So I think uh, apart from the fact that you know, unsustainable public finances, for instance, uh, mean that you have to cut rather than to spend, it is also that political element I think that is very important. Now, in the context of, um, of the G20, um, we are also, besides the importance of uh, macroeconomic stability, we are also uh, heading the initiatives uh, relating to uh, supporting risk assessment in the private sector, uh, where we have the so-called Green Finance Study Group, um, which is a process where uh, we want to, you know, where we want to have a process that generates the relevant information and suitable tools for risk assessment by the private sector, so that banks and investors can actually see, you know, what the risks are. Um, but I, I stop here. Thank you. That's uh, very kind of you. And uh, uh, last but not least, the person that we haven't heard yet is uh, Ama Bhattacharya, um, Brookings Institute, um, working uh, or have been working in your past with many, many, many organizations uh, trying to come to a result. Um, the big question is, of course, uh, um, whilst uh, the northern countries uh, um, have a big role to play as users, um, it's, it's um, basically on the backs um, of uh, developing countries um, that the whole process is, is done. We've heard from Lord Stern that it's about uh, sustainable infrastructure. How much help, um, how much assistance, how much um, policy initiatives um, are needed uh, in order to get the policies right on that scale? Um, so I think, first of all, um, I would say it's the emerging markets and uh, developing countries that can ride the crest rather than be the ones who are ridden upon. <laughs> so uh, what do I mean by that? And very much building on what Lord Stern said. I mean, there are two, two major challenges that we face today. Uh, the first is how do we get uh, uh, eliminate uh, poverty and improve uh, well-being everywhere? And the second is how do we do that without destroying our planet? And for too long, these were seen as objectives in conflict. But as, uh, again, Lord Stern said, they are intimately connected, and they are connected through the investment process of sustainable infrastructure. So roughly two-thirds of that investment in sustainable infrastructure will happen in emerging markets and developing countries, and roughly 80% of carbon-sensitive investments will happen in emerging markets and developing countries. So this new investment is a, should be seen as an opportunity to do things differently and to do things better. Who's going to finance them? But before you get to the finance, I would say that you have to do both sides. Mm -hmm. You have to get the policies right so that those investments are sound and you need to get the finance right. At the moment, we have tremendous opportunities, tremendous needs, but we are not able to translate them into realized demand. And there are plentiful of savings, but we are not able to effectively translate them into right finance at the right time. So bringing, building this bridge between policy and finance is a complex challenge. Why? 
because in the case of infrastructure, we are making decisions for the very long term. And governments find it difficult, and the market finds it difficult to make right decisions about such long-term decisions. And second, markets do not, are not able to price those risks, particularly in emerging markets and developing countries. So there's a lot of now coming together of how do we create effective platforms that can create virtuous cycle, create the enabling conditions, bring down risks, and bring forth the finance. And again, as Lord Stern said, a critical role here is for the multilateral development banks. Thank you very much uh, for that stone that I'm uh, sort of going to throw into a different pond now. Um, Lord Stern, whenever I hear the word complexity, um, it seems to contradict um, your sense of urgency or sense of urgency that's probably felt by every person here in the room, um, seeing that uh, I think about 10 years ago, people went around like saying 2015 is the year of the turning point. So if we don't get our policies right by 2015, um, then we need to invest much, much more money. We need to invest much, much more effort to still adhere to this two degree goal that we've all set ourselves. So aren't we um, sort of uh, somewhere caught uh, between the devil and the deep blue sea, urgency on one side, complex decision making by everybody, both here in this room and also at the table? I think a complex world requires clarity of what we're trying to do as a world and where we're going. And fortunately, uh, in 2015, and it continued into 2016, um, we have that clarity. We have the clarity of the sustainable development goals, of wanting to stay well below two degrees. And that uh, helps us see the way through to policy. I completely agree with Lutka. You'd want to have markets operating as effectively as we can within the overall goals that we've set ourselves as a world. And that's what defines the scarcity, the goals that we have set ourselves. And what we did in our uh, work with uh, the Carbon Pricing uh, Commission, co-chaired by Joe Stiglitz and myself, is to say, given that definition of where we want to go and the implicit scarcity that follows from it, these are the kind of prices that are likely to be necessary in the markets to drive that change. And so it gives guidance, for example, if we're doing better at the emissions trading scheme, and Europe surely has to do better at the emission trading scheme, I do hope my own country stays uh, strongly involved in that, um, the UK. Um, what kinds of price flaws do we need in the emissions trading scheme as we boost it up, as Europe starts to move forward again, we hope, much stronger economy? How do we revise that? So what we're offering is, in a complex world, clarity about where we're going here in terms of the Paris Agreement, well below two degrees, and, and asking what kind of prices are going to get us there. Amara said the same thing when he looked at the capital markets. Yeah. We can see that the cost of capital is far too high. You, you're paying in many infrastructure projects around the world, eight or nine percent real, when interest rates in the world are on the floor. What goes wrong there? The capital markets for handling the risk are not working well enough. So how do we, as people who uh, think that market mechanisms are the best and most efficient way of driving things, how we can we get help overcome the faults and difficulties in the markets? And Amar described some ways of doing that, particularly through the confidence that the MDBs bring, some of the skills they bring, but also the financial instruments to get through the difficult early stages of infrastructure. So price of carbon, cost of capital, two clear ways where a bit of clarity in a complex world helps us to find policy. Very quickly, i uh, throw the ball to you. I mean, we have this uh, green square microphone, so uh, basically I'm, I'm throwing that to you virtually. You were nodding, um, so uh, what's your answer? No, uh, no, I agree. I think that the, um, the role of the multilateral development banks will be key in this process, and they have the expertise, because in many cases it's expertise. How open are they? And, um, and th it's also a question of 
um, their role, their role, I think, or th and their own understanding in the process is changing to a certain extent in that they see their role more as one of crowding in private finance, exactly. which will also be very important to deal with the situation that their capital is limited. They can use their capital more efficiently, but I think their role is also to uh, bring in private capital and to create an environment for private capital mm. to come in. But maybe one additional point to Nick's, and I think um, uh, that is, uh, the, the it's, it's not only an issue of functioning financial markets where the MDBs can help, but it's also an issue of functioning policies, as we all know. And in the G20 context, I think, you know, no country is free of sins here. <laughs> but, um, I mean, there's one initiative also in the G20 context regarding Africa, the compact with Africa, where we want to address in particular the policy side to reduce risks and not just to kind of throw money at it. And um, in, in that sense, I think the, the we need a comprehensive approach. Um, you mentioned urgency and um, complexity. And I think that the processes like here, the T20, the B20, G20, all these processes are very, very good processes because um, they bring all the players together to develop the, the, the playing field, the, the, to prepare the grounds in a way for agreements like Paris. And they are also the fora that help to sustain the debate and to develop the agenda, even if not all political players are equally able to move forward at the same time. So I would say that one of the achievements of our G20 presidency so far has been to keep exactly this work program going, that when the political environment is, is right, that we can move forward also there. Very briefly, I see if you've got five minutes left. So um, one minute on what BASF as a global player does um, in order to get its carbon footprint in order. Yeah, first of all, let me say that uh, we need predictable policies and we need predictable frameworks, which is really a challenge in today's world. We make investments for the next 20, 30 years. So every single that has been discussed here is helpful, but at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's about building trust. Companies will only invest if there is trust that you will have a decent return over time. Nevertheless, in, in, in the case of our industry and, and BSF as a chemical industry, um, sustainability is really the core of what we're doing because we are basically providing the tools and innovations which you need to have a more sustainable environment. When you talk about transportation, energy, water, this is all about chemistry at the end of the day. So it's really about our innovations and our inventiveness, how to solve uh, these problems. Uh, and we do this when we can make money, bluntly spoken. I, uh, need to, I need to ask one more question. How do you handle the carbon price? I mean, uh, we, we know what BSF does, and it's um, quite remarkable calling itself a sustainable company. But what do you do internally? Uh, currently, carbon pricing for us is a shadow pricing. We, uh, we have an estimate what the carbon price could be over time, and then we uh, pressure test our investment whether they are still viable under those price scenarios. In reality, it's a kind of a tricky assessment because if your competitors don't do it and you forego an investment and your competitor uh, applies different yardstick, then you lose competitiveness over time. And for that simple reason, again, we want to have a global playing field and the best of all worlds, one carbon price. Amma, what do you expect of the G20? Well, what I expect of the G20 at this mo moment is to remain steadfast in its commitment to the SDGs and to climate and to see them as joint and to provide the leadership which Germany is providing right now. So that's key. But it's also important to be able to address the instruments. And there are really three things that have to come together. Country policies, the bar has to be raised. The ra you have to raise the bar on f private finance, both in terms of you know, the kind of, not only the early stage risk, but also take out finance. And third part, I think the G20 has already taken an important initiative, thanks to the gentleman sitting next to me, mm -hmm. is to take a cl clear look at the MDB system to see how it can perform its role in a more effective way. Lutko, what are you gonna do for Hamburg? 
for Hamburg, we are going to try to conclude on the work program that we've set ourselves. I've outlined some of the things. One of the things that we wanted to achieve, we did not achieve, that is the phasing out of fossil fuel subsidies. But on the, all the other elements, I think we are pretty much on track and we hope we can then have a, a good basis for the Argentinian presidency afterwards and provide support to them as well. Thank you very much for throwing the ball into the future. Uh, Nick, um, of course, um, the, the climate doesn't care whether we have G20, G77, G7, whatever, as long as we don't get results. You have been incredibly positive uh, about everything else. Um, you've been positive after Paris. You've been positive when Trump was elected, who still doesn't uh, commit uh, to the climate goals that his government has signed. Um, where do you get that optimism from? Yeah, we have to distinguish very carefully between optimism about what we can do and optimism about what we will do. But unless we're optimistic about what we can do, we cannot generate the optimism that we will need to do those things. If you look at the way the world has changed in the last 10 years, when we wrote the Stern Review, published a bit over 10 years ago, mm. we didn't anticipate that the price of a solar panel now would be one-tenth of what it was then. We didn't anticipate that the major car companies of the world would be developing electric and hybrid vehicles. We didn't anticipate the tremendous uh, advance in materials that's leading to um, better storage, to better insulation. The world has moved very rapidly in technology because the leaders of the world have set a path. So I'm optimistic. Uh, China peaked coal <coughs> probably <coughs> three years ago. We didn't anticipate that either. So there have been very strong movements in a good direction, but we are not moving fast enough. And that's where the worry, the distinction between uh, optimism about what we can do, optimism about what we will do. My optimism about the United States comes from New York, from California, from the big American firms that are moving strongly in this direction, from the tremendous creativity of Silicon Valley. And that, I think, is uh, well-founded. We hope that uh, the President of the United States makes sensible decisions. Thank you very much. So uh, we are agreed uh, that the framework needs to be set correctly, as uh, you said a number of times, but in the end, we all have to live it, and we all have to contribute, uh, both as uh, uh, companies, um, as uh, individuals, uh, as uh, representatives of governments, as always... Uh, as think tanks. As think tanks uh, that are putting forward. But, ladies and gentlemen, there is one reason why we need to do that, um, to achieve the two-degree goal, because we have a future generation, and... Uh, the nice thing is at this T20, we have the future generation present. We have 100 young people that apply to take part in this from more than 100 countries. Well, from 100 countries on the whole. Um, so it's the G20, the young people, so to say. And they have done something uh, in order to prepare us for lunchtime. And I think we're going to see that up on the big screen. Enjoy your meal from the United States. Lek at Jammu from Senegal. Buen provecho from Argentina. Aap apne khane ka anand lijiye from India. Maikana from Fiji. Mirirun Kanji from Benin. Nikmati Hidangar Anda from Malaysia. Buen provecho desde España. Disfruta de tu comida desde Colombia.